and when. Welcome to the City Council meeting of February 3rd, 2022. City Clerk, could we have preamble, please? The me this meeting is compliant with the Ralph M. Brown Act as amended by California Assembly Bill Number 361, effective September 16th, 2021, providing for a public health emergency exception to the standard teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide a safe environment for the public, staff, and council members while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Members of the public may view the joint city council, city council meeting by logging into the Zoom webinar listed below. City council meetings can also be viewed live and are on demand via the city's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archive videos can be replayed on the city's website, brisbaneca.org forward slash meetings. The city council meeting will be an exclusively virtual meeting. The agenda materials may be viewed online at brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom webinar, the following email and text line will also be monitored during the meeting and public comments received will be noted for the record during oral communications one and two or during an item. Email ipadilla at brisbaneca.org, text 628-219-2922, join the Zoom webinar with the ID 9919362. 8666 and the passcode 123456. The call in number is 1669 900 9128. If you need special assistance to participate in this meeting, please contact the city clerk at 415 508 2113. Notification in advance of the meeting will enable the city to make reasonable arrangements to ensure accessibility to this meeting. Thank you. Call to order at 8.34 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance. to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation <laughs> under God, Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk, roll call, please. Council Member Cunningham? Here. Council Member Davis? Here. Council Member Lance? Here. Council Member O'Connell? Here. Mayor Mackin? Here. I have a motion and second to adopt the agenda as it stands, please. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Cunningham? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Mackin? Aye. City Clerk, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on an item not on the agenda? Madam Mayor, I receive, have received no text messages or emails, and I see no raised hands at this time. Okay. Thank you. We move on to the consent calendar. Would any council member like to remove an item from the consent calendar? Absent that, I'll take a motion and a second. I'll make a motion to approve item A, B, C, D, and E. Um, I'm sorry, we do have a note. Staff would like to remove consent calendar item E for further discussion. So we'll be approving A, B, C, and D. Okay. Phrase. Okay. okay. Oh, all right, thank you. Roll call, please. Council Member Cunningham? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Mackin? Aye. So we've moved item E, which is adopt a resolution formally creating the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accountability IDEA Committee. Staff report, please. Yes, the staff met with the subcommittee for IDEA 
the council subcommittee earlier this week, and they are may, would make one recommendation different from what is presented in the staff report. Um, one of the things that's, that is in the staff report that is different from what you had seen previously is that the staff was recommending that the committee be reduced from to a five to seven person committee consistent with all of the other committees that the city council has appointed. The subcommittee agreed with that, but the subcommittee also had a conversation concerning how to go about recruiting for members of committees and subcommittees or committees for the, for, and commissions for the council. And the conversation that they had that was specific to the idea committee was to have the people be on this first go around appointed for one year and two years as opposed to two and four years. And then after their one year and two years are served, they would then ask the city council if they would like to participate again for an additional two years. And the city council would then at that point in time be able to reappoint them prior to opening it up to other people. And the re rationale for this was that there is a number of people in our community who may not want to commit to a four year term, but can commit to a one or a two year term. Additionally, since the idea committee, the community wide idea committee is also a bit has people from the business community sitting on it. The thought was that people in the business community may be hesitant to apply for a committee where they needed to serve on a four year term since they may not know where they're going to be in four years. So in order to broaden the number of applicants that are available for this committee, the subcommittee is recommending to the city council to change the, the initial appointment from one to two years with the option for people to, to extend for an additional two years. And the city and staff has sent out a, re a substitute resolution if the city council would like to do make, you know, follow up with that motion. Do you have any questions from council members? No. Madison? No. Council no. Member Cunningham? No. no. Okay. Do we have any members of the public wishing to comment? City Clerk? Um, Madam Mayor, I received no text messages, no email messages, and I see no raised hands at this time. Okay. Council discussion? Anyone wish to start? I, th I think that the um, we should accept the subcommittee's recommendation for the term and the extension provisions. Anyone else? And if there's no comments, I'll entertain a motion and a second. I'll make that I'll motion. Second. second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Cunningham. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lentz? Aye. Councilmember O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Mackin? Aye. We move on to new business. First item is receive the Open Space and Ecology Committee 2022 work plan and report of 2021 accomplishments. Could we have a staff report, please? Certainly, Madam Mayor. Give me a moment here and I will share my screen. Well, you can see the slides now. Yes. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Adrian Etherton, Sustainability Manager, here to present the OSEC 2021 accomplishments and our 2022 work plan. I do want to acknowledge that we have a number of OSEC members with us this evening, including Chair Barbara Ebel, Glenn Fieldman, and Michelle Salmon. I apologize if I missed anybody. I can't see my participant screen anymore. So I'll just start off with the accomplishments over the last year. As an advisory committee, we worked on a number of policy recommendations, including the climate emergency declaration adopted last July and the disposable foodware ordinance adopted in April. In addition, the committee worked on some policies we hope to bring forward for your consideration this year. On the climate action front, the building efficiency program achieved nearly 80% compliance in the first reporting year, and additional efforts focused on electric vehicle charging, charging, including continued strong usage at the Brisbane Village Fast Charger. Our annual Habitat event series was able to resume in the latter half of the year, 
including coastal cleanup day in September, where an estimated six and a half tons of waste were cleared from the lagoon area by a couple dozen volunteers. We also continued a number of ongoing habitat efforts, including letters to Brisbane Acres owners, which resulted in a property donation near the end of the year. OSEC's work always includes a significant number of events, education, and outreach, and the past year was no different. Highlights included the second annual Recycled Arts and Crafts Contest and participation in the United Against Climate Change Fair uh, organized by local youth in the community park. Finally, I would just note a few staff projects which were supported by OSEC for their environmental and climate impacts including continuation of the spring compost giveaway, the addition of electric vehicles to the city fleet, and the installation of e-ink signboards in the community park and at Mission Blue. Moving to the work plan for this year, I would note that this was discussed last week with OSEC and our council liaisons, and direction from that discussion was incorporated into the version brought forth to council. OSEC's primary role is to provide policy recommendations on environmental issues, so it comes as no surprise that a number of the top items on the work plan are policy issues. We hope to bring forward a recommended update to the 2001 open space plan soon, and also advance a dark skies outdoor lighting ordinance, both items that were worked on in 2021. In addition, the triennial building code updates are coming up, so we anticipate looking at reach codes again, including considering expanding to existing buildings, which is a growing part of the conversation at the state and regional level. OSEC will also be working to study and draft an, inv an invasive species ordinance. We'll of course continue the annual habitat efforts. And in fact, our first habitat event of the year was already held in January. In education and outreach, we are looking forward to bringing an OSEC display to the new library in the next couple of months. Uh, last week's discussion, um, we talked extensively about how we can support the health and growth of the urban tree canopy, and we'll continue to explore options in that area. Uh, there is also a new state law banning the sale of small off-road engines, such as gas leaf leaf blowers starting in 2024, which we hope to support through education and outreach. And of course, providing input on design of the Baylands open space upon council approval of the land use. Finally, I just note some of the items for staff, uh, implementation of policies and programs supported by OSEC. Uh, we'll continue implementing the climate action plan and begin working towards our new climate emergency declaration goals. Major efforts are expected to include pursuing energy efficiency, fuel switching, renewables, and energy storage opportunities at some of our city facilities, implementation of the new organics law, SB 1383, in collaboration with South San Francisco Scavenger and the county, and the likely installation of EV charging stations. We, of course, continue to support other city endeavors, such as the review of the Bayland specific plan and EIR and participation in regional sustainability collaborations. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Adrienne. And, and personally, I would just like to thank OSEC for all that you do. And looking at this schedule, it's very ambitious, but I, I also noted over the years how many things you actually accomplish. And it's it's really impressive. So do we have any council comments or questions? Terry? I too want to thank all the members of OSEC for their longstanding work and um, dedication to sustainability. But I do think that this should be the OSEC's work plan, not the sustainability work plan. I think that OSEC is the community and sustainability is one of their goals, but it, it does reflect their work plan. But thank you all for your hard work. Councilmember Cunningham? No? Yeah, no, excuse me. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for all the hard work as well. Um, I'm losing my voice, so I'll uh, keep it to a dull row here. Councilmember uh, Davis. <clears throat> I want to thank 
um, our open space and ecology committee for all that they do. Um, I know that, you know, they have so many dedicated members who eat, breathe, sleep, OSEC. And for that, I'm very appreciative um, and keep up the good work. Councilmember Lentz. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this, uh, this list of things that you've done is just awesome. It is so impressive. And you guys were busy, not just for the sake of being busy, but you were busy with a purpose and, and a commitment uh, to what OSEC is about. And, and Adrian, we are so blessed to have you be a part of the Brisbane staff. And um, I always thought that you did fabulous work with um, sustainable Salmon Tail County. And, you know, it just seems like it's just such a great partnership that you've had with the committee members and yourself, and you're just taking it to the next level. It's not just benefiting the city of Brisbane, but you're really benefiting the region as a whole and becoming a, a real role model for other cities. So just two thumbs up. It's just fantastic. Thank you so much to everyone involved. Yeah, I, I actually want to echo what Councilmember Lentz said. I think sometimes we take for granted we we have this wonderful committee and they do so many things. It, it's just it's not surprising, but I think we should be surprised. And I do think in a lot of ways we're really setting a tone for other cities in the peninsula because I've, I've heard that comment from other cities in the county, how we really are, are setting goals and moving ahead rapidly. And I'd, I'd like to thank both the committee members, the staff that work with them and public works for their support in all of those endeavors and, and implementing a lot of those projects to make them move forward. So do we have any members of the public city clerk that wanted to weigh in on this? We have a raised hand for Michelle Salmon. Okay. Michelle, go ahead. I would just like to thank the city of Brisbane for the support to the Open Space and Ecology Committee and to my fellow committee members and to Adrian and Karen Kinzer um, for their support in the, the initiatives that we want to accomplish. It's not always easy, but uh, I am very appreciative. And thank you to the council and our liaison committee for your support as well. We really appreciate it. We've got a lot more work to do. Thank you. Any other members of the public, city clerk? City clerk, you're muted. I, I yeah, think we're frozen. Barbara. Barbara has a hand raised. Okay, Barbara, you want to go ahead? Um, I just want to. Uh, Basically say what Michelle said, we're very, we're very grateful to have the support of the city of the Brisbane um, with full time sustainability manager. And because, you know, that in concert with some really dedicated citizens has allowed Brisbane to um, really kind of set set the, as you said, set this tone for um, what sustainability means for a city in the Bay Area. And I think um, we need to be incredibly proud of ourselves and of all the work we've accomplished together. And thank you, everyone. And I look forward to continuing to serve with you. Thank you for your service. Anyone else? I don't see any other hands. Okay. Colleen, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I need to log out and come back in. Uh, everything I have is frozen. So I'll be back in just a moment. Okay. Thank you. We'll take a pause and just wait for Council Member Cunningham to return. City Clerk, if you could let me know when she's admitted back into the meeting, please. Will do. And uh, Madam Mayor, I just also wanted to acknowledge Glenn Fieldman. She's also um, in the in the attendee list, but she's also OSEC member um, that's in attendance. 
Did Glenn want to address the meeting? I don't see a raised hand, but oh yes. So now I see a raised hand. Okay, while we're waiting for Council Member Cunningham, how about we'll take Glenn's comments? Glenn, go ahead. I will echo uh, Michelle and Barbara in thanking the council for their support and echo both of them also in saying that we have an awful lot more to do. So your support will be greatly appreciated as we move forward. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying that we have to reduce our emissions 50% by 2030, which is only eight years away. It's really a daunting task. So I'm really, but I'm really proud to be a resident of this city that cares about these things and is committed to meeting those goals. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks, Glenn. I think we can echo what, what Glenn said that when you start looking at the goals that we have to meet, it, it's really mind boggling. And yet all these different programs, that's really what it takes. Every single little bit means so much in terms of the whole planet. We've got to start somewhere. So. Has Council Cunningham come back yet? I don't see her. Not yet, Madam Mayor. All right, admitting her back in. Okay. Council Member Cunningham, can you Hello. hear us? I can. Go okay. ahead. Welcome back. Thank you. Adrian, again, thank you for the presentation. Very well done. Moving on, we have the Complete Street Safety Committee 2022 Work Plan, Report of 2021 Accomplishments. Staff report, please. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the Council. Let me share my screen, a couple of slides to show you also. Slides, if I can. There we go, everyone can see my screen? Yes. All right, so the Complete Streets Safety Committee has been busy this past year as well. As well. I've got a few highlights from the report. Uh, they worked a bit, maybe not in 2021, but was implemented in 2021, the changes to the intersection at San Bruno and Bayshore Boulevard. This is showing the layout of the no left turn that was added at all times from eastbound San Bruno onto Bayshore. And this was a picture when it was rolled out, we had orange flags to signal that people could not turn left. And reports have been that there's been high level of compliance. Later in the year, we put in the mast arm on um, the eastbound side of Bayshore so that we could hang the no U-turn signs in both directions. And that's been effective too. And again, um, that mast arm was placed in case that we in the future we put a traffic signal that it could be utilized for that as well. The committee received comments about safety bicycling on Old County Road and they reviewed and asked for some improvements and we've put in um, MUTCD signs uh, which I believe those community members were pleased with. There was a discussion of putting in chairs too and we, we have not executed that, but we've looked at future improvements should we 
repave Old County Road to possibly put in a bike lane and we would bring it. We, there were a number of um, intersections where um, sight lines were difficult and committee reviewed those. And in, it's a little bit hard to see this picture as far away, but in many cases we put in convex mirrors, some signage, we tried to be sensitive to um, removing parking spaces because that's that's one of the ways to increase visibility, but parking is a challenge as we know. And the committee looked at, or a subcommittee, and then the full committee looked at the usage of the shuttles and made some recommendations to improve shuttle stops. We're doing a couple of things at this one at 140 Valley that's heavily used and at San Bruno at Mendocino. In this location, we put in a pad and we have a purchase order issued to put in a bus shelter here. And at the other location, we are planning to put in a bench. These Measure W funds were um, a recent sales tax that the county passed that can be used for pavement maintenance. But if you have a good pay overall pavement maintenance score, you can use the money for a complete streets project. So we're kind of dividing it between the both of those. Uh, the committee looked at, in response to requests from the community, improvements to the bike lane, and I call this a, we a weaving situation between the bike lane that is on the shoulder in South San Francisco, across the off-ramp lane of the exit, the flyover 426A exit from Highway 101. And we're working through, we sent our recommendations to South San Francisco because the the green bike lane straddles both cities and they wanted to do some review and, and they're considering some of the mess messaging so we're still kind of I still need to circle back with the complete streets committee but we're looking at making that safer at the request of bicyclists and we're also encouraging or requesting of caltrans as part of their managed lane program for highway 101 that if they have to move that flyover that they make an adequate Caltrans standard crossing for bicyclists in this area. So there has been some work and work continues at this location. The committee worked quite a bit last year and even before on parking challenges in central Brisbane, did a lot of data collection, did a survey of the community that got quite a large number of responses, over 300, which is, which is good for, for surveys in town. And they have formed a recommendation that will be brought to council in the near future, asking for direction and it may require more work by the committee or may, we may be able to come to a conclusion, but look for that in an upcoming meeting. They met recently, we didn't have the benefit of getting together with the liaisons because we'd done it back in October and came up with their things they were interested in working on. So that's what this list is. And at this point, the committee is um, interested in hearing feedback from the council on what the priorities are and how much we, should the list be what we think we can accomplish in a year or we wanna leave everything on the list that, that the council would like the committee to work on. And I wanna note that a couple of current members are present at the meeting tonight, Alex Lau and Linda Detmer. Thank you, Karen. Um, I just I want to just start by saying that uh, this is another very hardworking committee. And when I look at the different areas that you highlighted in this presentation, these are the details that are so important to making someplace safe. Um, I used to almost get T-boned every time I went out the south end of San Bruno Avenue. I've only seen one car do a U-turn in a whole year now since that mast arm went up. That makes a huge difference. Um, all of those safety improvements, things that make people comfortable, the bus stops, this, this is real quality of life issues, but also keeping people safe so they, they don't end up in an accident. So I am very, very appreciative for all that you do and everything here that's on your list. So first I, I wanna turn it over if there's any other council members would like to ask any questions. I don't have questions. I have a comment. Sure. You know, I, it's, it is, you're absolutely right. And, I, and I'm sorry, I had, to, I had 
technical difficulties with the OSAC presentation, but for everybody who does all of this work, it is astonishing. And thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody so much. This is going to help our you know, way of life moving forward to have this committee uh, and OSAC just, just keep pushing at the things that are really important on their agendas. So thank you, everybody. Council Member Lentz. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. And, and, you know, I totally agree with you, Colleen. It is about the details, right? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe OSEC is the sexy, you know, list of things. And, and, and Fleet Streets is, and safety is, is, is like getting down to the bone and, and, and about safety, right? And you've seen one U-turn. I haven't seen any since, since that arm went up. And, you know, thank goodness, you know, that, that when we approved it and the time that it went up that we didn't have any major accidents, but you, you know that, that that was always the potential. And now that that is there, uh, you know, who knows, you know, uh, whose life we, we might have saved because of, of that action and that, that determination by, by the committee to, to, to push that, that forward. Um, yeah, you know, um, the, um, that bike lane on, on Old County. Yeah, I hope you guys, you know, continue to, to, to push that and hopefully get funding uh, or because you're looking for funding, Karen? Um, I think we, we would be open to it. Yeah, we're, yeah okay, I mean, we, were, uh, we were thinking we need to restripe when we resurface the street, but that's a few years out. So sure, we try to get it. Okay, no, I think that would be fantastic. And you know what, I, I, um, I, I do have a question for you and, and um, I know we're waiting to get the go ahead for the Crocker Park Trail. We have the that you know investigating the uh, cultural, um, I, I guess you know making sure that there aren't uh, significant cultural artifacts uh, on the trail to you know, and so in order to get the funding to to move forward. But you know, I was on the trail today, and at West Hill, um, I noticed that there isn't. Um, you know, like a little button that you can push and have the um, the intersection or the crosswalk light up like you do at South Hill. So is that some, do we have to wait for the funding to do the whole trail or is that something that we can maybe do sooner than later? To, um, to have the rapid flashing beacons that we have at South Hill? Yeah, yeah, because you know, when you're, heading south on on the trail and you're crossing over west hill that that's a that's a sharp blind turn and those cars are coming down fast because it's downhill right um there were recommendations in the master plan that was recently done and i don't know if the resurfacing funding if we would have enough to to implement those but we can either bring that forward as a we can assess how much it costs either bring it forward as a capital project or look for additional funding to do that. Okay, all right. And yeah, and just, you know, thank you so much to the, to the committee members for all your hard work and just creativity. I mean, this list doesn't happen. Those things don't occur, you know, without you getting excited and working with staff to, 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 to make it happen. So thank you very, very much for all your dedication to, to our community. Council Member O'Connell. I just wanted to thank the members of the Complete Street for their dedication. Seems like we have a frozen screen, Terry. How to do things right, because the last three times I've gone through that San Bruno Avenue, Bayshore intersection, I've seen someone do something illegal. The last three times I've been there. Uh, two were a U-turn and one was a left. So um, I think there's still a lot of education that needs to go on um, and perhaps enforcement, but I think at least people are now realizing it's illegal and that they're at least looking at it a little bit more, um, maybe just to see that nobody's watching them, but uh, at least they're thinking twice about it. 
but thank you all for your hard work. Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Complete Streets. You're our unsung heroes. Um, I was just, I'm so impressed with the diligence that you apply to things. I mean, I think that should be the expectation, but for some reason, I'm just always really blown away by how thorough you are in your analysis. Like, I know that you guys were out there on the corner, I think, on Bayshore, observing what was going on and marking things down. Um, and I think there's probably been other places in the city in which you guys have actually conducted field studies and observed all these near accidents and things going on. So you could have a really good, you know, really good data to work from. And um, just all that, that extra work that you do outside of meetings and visiting sites and spending that extra time, um, you know, I know informs your decision-making process in a way that, um, yeah, I think really helps us come to decisions that are, that actually can solve problems um, because you do that necessary work of getting down to it, getting into the field and observing what's going on so that you can formulate a solution. So I just want to thank you for all of that dedication and those hours that you put into um, these issues outside of meetings. And I know how, I know some of you must like at nine o'clock get an idea about how we could fix an intersection. And um, yeah, thank you for spending that time. So um, I understand that there's been no time to meet with liaisons, but I just wondered if any members of the council would like to weigh in on the work plan and what they see as priorities. Would anyone like to do that? If not, I'll start. <laughs> I, what jumps out at me is this number five, SB 43, regarding local speed limits, because I think that also encompasses number four to some degree. And when we talk about that intersection on Bayshore, I, day after day, uh, I'm run over by people going 65 miles an hour. And I don't know if we have any chances for federal funds, for infrastructure, traffic calming. Karen Kinzer, we've learned that word from you and we should be beating the drum on that. That's probably one of the best things I ever learned on Complete Streets. And um, I'm very concerned about our major intersection. We're gonna have a lot of cars coming out of Sierra Point with all the development. And I would not want to cross Bayshore Boulevard. I see people running the red light, and honestly, they're going 65 miles an hour because they're all behind me honking. So that would be one of my favorite projects for complete streets. But I think the parking is something they've been working on and certainly um, also worthy of, I, I would say expedited completion if we can at least start getting into discussion on that. Any other council members? You know, Madam Mayor, I think um, the list is really good uh, and it's comprehensive and, you know, a lot of thought has gone into uh, creating this this list for us to, to evaluate. Um, it, it looks very strong to me. I mean, it, it's, if they could even come close to, to completing half of these things, uh, it would make a significant uh, difference uh, in regards to safety in our community. Um, you know, I, I know we're waiting on the Crocker Park, uh, trail money, but, um, if it would be possible to have the, um, you know, the light up for folks to press the button when they cross that intersection, um, I, I hope we could add that to the list sooner than later. I, I have something, Madam Mayor. Yes. Council Member Cunningham. So we, we've had a discussion in the past, it's not here. I think it needs to be here. And it's not just, you know, a couple of people crossing the Crocker Park Trail in any one place or another, not to diminish that cliff by any stretch of the imagination, but the people walking into Brisbane on Bay Shore to go to school, to go to work, to go to the bus stop, whatever, We've had this discussion 
Uh, last time we had this discussion, the following morning, I went down and walked from uh, Bayshore, San Bruno, to Brisbane on the, the side of the road, and I was terrified. Um, I think that is a really important thing that is not on this list mm -hmm. that I'm hoping we can get added to that list. Um, I took a bunch of photos that I sent to the city, and some of these photographs showed um, huge tire marks where trucks had gone off the road to where people would be walking. And hopefully it's nobody is ever going to be in those spots when another truck does that. But there's uh, development uh, agreements with people who may or may not ever develop on Bayshore or maybe not for the next 20 years or whatever. But I don't think we have time to wait to look at that and figure out a way to put distance and protection between the people who are walking from, I'm just gonna say our, our, our trailer park area um, out into Brisbane on that road. It is extremely dangerous. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage every single one of you um, at about eight o'clock in the morning to go down and walk from San Bruno Bayshore into San Francisco to see what I mean. I think that is a massive safety issue that is not on this list that I believe should be. If I may echo what Council Member Cunningham just said, we've never established a safe route to school and there are kids that live in that trailer park. So I, I would encourage this being added to the list as well. Maybe taking in the, the scope that along with safe sidewalks going along Bayshore to Old County that we look at the bike lanes and that this be part of also traffic calming so we get the separation and it may also help the speed. Maybe we can take advantage of some grants or some infrastructure funds. In addition, as we're doing sidewalks and bike lanes, that may improve our fire hardening along Bayshore so we end up accomplishing three things. So if we could add that to that list, I think that's that's worthy of something being given a little bit priority. Any other council members? May I, before we go on? I yeah. mean, there is, there is BPAC funding available and, and this totally fits into that, that category of money that they would spend. And if we could get that on the list and bring that BPAC committee up and have them walk on Bayshore um, at eight o'clock in the morning. I'm sure they see my point. Thank you. I'll be quiet now. Okay. Council Member Davis, did you have anything on the work? I don't have anything to add. Okay. All right. Um, public comments. Looks like I can see Linda Detmer has her hand up. Linda, you want to go ahead? You've got your mic is off. There we go. Thank you um, for allowing me to speak. And I just want to echo what you and Karen have spoken about um, on the Bayshore walk from the mobile home park to central Brisbane. It is terrifying. Um, it's very scary. And I'm mostly am concerned for uh, the kids that need to walk that to get to school. That's big, but also, in the mobile home park, there's a lot of senior citizens that um, may or may not walk that way, uh, depending on their ability. But um, it's an, another safe pedestrian walkway that I, I fully agree should be on this list um, and will depend on the council to prioritize the list. Um, and just quickly, I am speaking in behalf of Patrick Tainter, who's our chair, but wasn't able to be here tonight. And he asked me to just go over a couple of things that are on this list. Item number one, we have worked on until we're blue in the face and have um, at brainstormed and brainstormed and brainstormed. And I'm not completely convinced that the recommendations we're making are the end all be all, but they are the best ones that we could come up with. And those will be given to you very soon. Um, item number two we found was one of our priorities 
um, investigating the potential for one-way streets because that is a safe route and many children um, use Mariposa, Monterey, and even Mendocino as a route to get up to Lippman School. Um, item number three um, is the emergency vehicle access. And we've talked about this for eight years. Um, the, safe, the importance of having emergency vehicle access to every single home in Brisbane and having it be able to move easily through that street, wherever it's called, um, is vitally important to the safety of the people in Brisbane and can save a bunch of lives indirectly or directly. Um, Tulare Street is a nightmare and uh, we've worked on that, but we seem to be at a place where we're waiting and seeing um, where we can do that. Uh, another issue was speeding on the Northeast Ridge, and that was a challenge that was taken up by a subcommittee, worked on for uh, several months with a lot of time out on the site, um, counting and taking numbers. And uh, we had come up with some ideas for that item on the speeding. Um, however, that item was closed down late last year and taken off of our list to work. Um, number five, reviewing SB 43 regarding local speed limits is something that Patrick and I have discussed as an incredible way to create traffic calming. Um, when I was in Reno, I was driving around a residential neighborhood and there are little triangular pink signs that say traffic calming area, nothing else. And all of a sudden, I guess it's the pink that affected me and the politeness with which they were put up. They were little signs. I immediately checked my speed and slowed down even below the speed limit. I think it's very effective. Um, there, <clears throat> there are some other ideas that we um, have in our minutes, I'm sure, um, that we might be able to refer to again if we're allowed to work on this project again. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped back to Northeast Ridge and I was on, it's been a long night, SB 43. Uh, so we would like to review SB 43. Um, improving bike lanes and the initiative encouraging bike lane. Um, don't have a lot to say about that right now. Item number seven was referred to us by our liaisons, and um, we'd like to take a look at that. Um, and receive and comment on Baylands transportation, uh, the circulation plans, other proposals, and this was referred to us by the Director of Public Works, and we're looking forward to working on that also. Um, what we'd like from the City Council is to help us prioritize um, which items you think are most important for us to work on. And I'd like to thank you very much. Do we have any other members of the public? I don't see hands up. We have Michelle Salmon, Madam Mayor. Okay, Michelle, please go ahead. Thank you. I just want to bring up a safety issue that, uh, since we're talking about Bay Shore, this has happened several times and it almost ended in a collision. The uh, tanker trucks come uh, northbound on Old Bay Shore and uh, make a right turn onto a tunnel to go over the bridge. And they are not stopping when they have a red light. They blow through that intersection at full speed. Um, and I've, I'm always very careful because I've seen them do, do this so many times. But uh, recently, I was a passenger in a car. The car in front of us had already gone through the intersection. And here comes the tanker <laughs> truck barreling through there. And we were already across the intersection um, coming on there as well. And I hollered, stop. You know, and the driver stopped. If I hadn't said something, we could have been crushed by the tanker truck. And this has happened numerous times. I immediately called the police. They were unable to do anything about it because they hadn't witnessed it themselves and did not have an extra officer to send and meet me at the tank farm to uh, 
uh, confront the driver. And even though I got a license plate because I wasn't the driver, I could photograph it. It was a plate of the of the trailer and not the actual truck. But this is a serious safety concern. And it's also a concern for pedestrians that are going back and forth from um, the bus stop on the east side of the uh, road and people going back and forth to the BLT. And I just wanna bring it up since we were talking about safety issues on Bayshore, the speeding on Bayshore is just out of control. And uh, I, I think it really needs to, we need some traffic calming there, especially with the tanker trucks. And I don't know if the city can do outreach to the tank farm about it, but this is not the first time that this has happened. So thank you so much. Um, just to follow up, Michelle, isn't another one of the things that you've mentioned in the past, the big concrete blocks on tunnel? I've mentioned that. I brought it up at a recent uh, meeting asking to have those removed uh, because I think that they are, uh, they they pose a real safety issue. If anyone had to ditch, get out of the way of an oncoming uh, Google bus or tanker truck or whatever, there's nowhere to go. Uh, and running into those concrete blocks could be fatal. And uh, having had a head-on collision with a drunk driver at 80 miles an hour on Tunnel Road, I truly understand the danger of that road. And those concrete blocks, although they may limit the amount of uh, illegal dumping that was going on, I think that they put people at risk, a high risk, and I think they should be removed. I've asked that, that they be removed. Thank you, Madison, for bringing that up again. Yeah. We have a raised hand, Madam Mayor, from Council Member O'Connell. Hey, Council Member O'Connell, go ahead. You're, you're muted. There you go. Um, I really don't have anything to add on this. Um, I think that the all of the items are good that could, you know, benefit the community, but I'm not sure um, that I have anything that would be my top couple, if that's what you're looking for. Councilmember Lentz, you want to weigh in on this? Well, you know, um... I just want to thank you and Karen for being so passionate about improving the safety standards for folks that live at the at the at the mobile home park. And sometimes uh, they can feel um, neglected, you know, be on the outskirts. And um, I, I just really appreciate what you said, and and I, and I think of. Of, you know, looking at this list, that that should be one of the top priorities that that we address and, and find, try and find solutions for. So, th th thank you for you know really shining that that bright light on that. Yeah, actually, I I, I would knowing that Complete Streets has been working on parking issues personally, I'd like to see them finish that. But I would I would also like just looking at, at available funds and that potential for complete streets to then tackle this, this Bayshore issue, because I think it, it, it has implications to traffic calming as well. Extending the safe route to school there would be a start, but dealing with that as a focus. So then it would also um, perhaps help public works start examining engineering solutions to sidewalks, fire hardening, bike lane, traffic calming, and it's all the same area and it will have implications for so many things. So that would be my vote is to pull that in second place. But I would actually like to hear from our director of public works because I noted there are at least three projects there referred by the director. And I would like to find out if those other items uh, referred by public works are priority items to public works because I'm not I, I'm not able to ascertain the the urgency. So could we please, um, Randy? Could you weigh in on that or Karen? Either one of you. I'm happy to do it, ma'am. Since since I did refer those in, so I, I think items two and three are almost identical. Although item two may take a little more work on it. There, there has been some concern over the years. I think if you've gone out Mariposa and made that right-hand turn to go Solano for any reason, right, whether you're dropping kids off at Silver Spot, 
dropping herself off at the pool or dropping kids off at, at Littman, you find that it's a very off camera turn when you're turning to the right up at the top there and people break traction all the time. Really the bigger concern is that if you watched fire engines go up there, uh, especially when you get into certain types of apparatus that they have, they have a very difficult time going up there. Uh, and so one of the concerns we've addressed over many years with North County Fire Authority and their pre-attack plan and how we would stage equipment depending upon how a fire commences across the mountain in different locations is really creating a route for citizens to exit and fire apparatus to enter so that they're not in conflict. So that's part of why we've looked at this for so many years. We've tried to think, okay, so what happens? How would it work if we let all the incoming traffic go up Monterey and so in a normal day and situation where we're not worried about fighting a fire, traffic can come up to Monterey, there's a decent stop sign there, there's de decent site visibility, you can make a right hand turn, you're not breaking traction, you're not off camber, that seems to work better. And then if you're outbound from those areas we talked about, you go down Mariposa. In a fire response situation, it's the same thing, the only difference is now you've you just got the fire equipment coming up Mariposa, and you've got the exiting citizens going down Monterey, so we're trying to break that traffic up. Uh, the, the other piece about emergency vehicle access on all city streets, really the one that's troubled me for so many years is the turn at Glen Parkway in Humboldt. Uh, our, our firefighters at Station 81 are amazing drivers. They are they are able to get Engine 81 up around that corner. I, I tell you, I, have, I struggle getting the OES vehicle up there, which is just an extended version expedition. And I think that when we have out-of-town firefighters coming in and helping us with mutual aid, mutual aid support, that we struggle with that. So those pieces are very important to me, both in my role as the public works director and as a director of emergency services. Randy, didn't, didn't a USPS, like a postal truck fall over once? Over yes, there? That is correct. We yeah. had a postal truck fall over there. We've had a, not because of the term, but we had the, a 10 wheel truck many, many years ago uh, that was working on the Glen Park tank project come rolling down that hill backwards and take out uh, former mayor now deceased Cy Bologos. Uh, front house. Um, so it's a tricky, tricky road. Uh, it would not be inexpensive to do, but I think it's just one more of those things that um, if we can get folks to start thinking about it and start laying out what might be acceptable, then the engineering side of the house could design the plans and then we could go for grants. I think it's very much akin to what I hear at least the two of the council members talking about, about uh, requested improvements on Bayshore, whether that and not whether it be, because I think there are three things you want to do. You want to continue the safety we have there for bicyclists. You would like to add safety for pedestrians. And you also want to slow traffic down a little bit. But I think having this committee look at different variations of what that might be, not designing it, but looking at it, thinking about what they might tolerate and what is it a committee they could support. Then the engineering staff could take that on board. We can develop some 15 to 35 percent design level plans and move forward with trying to get grant applications. I will say, I know somebody who lives at the corner of Solano and Mariposa, and in the last three months, four months, they sent me two uh, photographs of two instances. One was a collision, because that's kind of people swing around, they're coming down from the pool, and someone's coming up and the visibility is not there. So two, there's been a collision there between two cars. And then also a big truck came and took out like half their half their wall their rotating wall with bricks and stuff and then just drove away and they had to track down the vehicle doesn't go very fast so they tracked it down in town and wrote down the information and the truck driver you know said that they they didn't know they hit their wall but it gets it's really tricky trying to maneuver in a big vehicle up there so i know personally just in the last few months of two collisions that have occurred right at that intersection. And it's not really an intersection, I want to say, because there's no stop sign on them yet, but right it's, in that it's, area. It's, it's been really challenging up there, especially with all the construction that's been going on at, down at the little end of Solano. And I, and I think this is one of those things where the, the uh, safety committee can really help you the most, because I think the biggest thing that's going to have to happen here is outreach with the residents that live in those blocks. It's going to have to be outreaching to them, and like, are you guys going to be okay with this? Is this is this going to work for you, or is that just, or is that an, uh, you know, a, just a, a a showstopper for them when they say no, we're digging our heels in for some reason, I, and we need, you know, boots on the ground, and that's one of the things that the safety committee has shown themselves to be very willing and and able to do. They're happy to get out there and do that work, so that might work for us. 
Randy, if I may ask, in, in terms of what we've also talked about on Bayshore, mm -hmm. how much lead time would something like that require? Because in terms of, of thinking about priority, when maybe these inf infrastructure funds become available, complete streets can do observations and make recommendations, but then you still have to do the engineering study. Right. So that's my concern is lead time. So, you know, once we get to the point where we've discussed what possible ideas there are, it, it's not it's not that difficult uh, time wise to put it in. Um, so off the top of my head, it, you want to slow traffic down on Bayshore? Eliminate the number two lane between uh, between San Bruno and uh, Old County. Make the number two lane go away. Make that the bike lane. Put a sidewalk in over where the bike lane is. But one of the things you got to remember with that, that will slow traffic down. We'd probably have to put some sort of chicane, some back and forth slaloming type movement, but it's going to influence the commute time of every single resident here. And well, during rush hour, it'll be difficult. But your other alternative is you carve a sidewalk into the toe of the slope. And, and I'm sure everyone's noticed uh, how many slope failures we had. Now, certainly not in the area we're talking about here. It's quite a bit further south of that. It's almost as you're getting out of town just before you get to the brick wall. But we've got at least three slope failures there. So playing around with the toes of the slope uh, is not a uh, is not a project to take out without understanding that there will be extensive costs. I mean, it, it will be hundreds, if not a million dollars, to do just because you're going to have to support that slope as you as you cut into it. And so then you end up with with extensive retaining walls. Uh, there there are no easy options, uh, but those are as as I'm thinking my way through this tonight. Those those are the ideas I'm coming up with. Uh, I'd be interested in, in chatting about those with the Complete Streets Committee and see what they think. So they, well, what, what would be palatable? Let's bounce it back and forth. Council Member Cunningham, since you're one of the liaisons, would you please weigh in on the priorities? Um, I, I think all the things that, you know, Randy talked about were really important. I mean, I know going up, um, Glen Parkway, making that right-hand turn onto Humboldt is near to impossible. I mean, even in my car, I cannot go up on the right-hand side of the road. I have to, at the top of that hill, swerve over into the far left-hand side of that road to make a turn to the right to get on Humboldt, or I completely bottom out. And that's in a, a new car. So I can't even imagine some of the older cars, let alone the trucks and everything else everybody's just talked about. So that's a priority. Obviously, that whole idea of getting the ingress, egress in an emergency is hugely important. So the Mariposa Monterey um, situation, uh, visitation of Solano, I've heard the story Madison just talked about many times. Um, so I would put those things where they are and have Bayshore in, the, in that mix right up the top somewhere. What if we put Bayshore number four, just thinking that number two and number three may not take as long as Bayshore's maybe going to be a lot more to tackle? Well, Bayshore's going to be huge. I mean, there's probably some, and I, and I did mention this in the past, some of the interim things we possibly could do is just clear some of the debris from the side of the road and just litter the whole place with rocks so at least people can walk further off the road and maybe put barriers down there which is not the most attractive thing to do but it's a barrier between trucks that have already veered off the road and potentially um could hit somebody in the future and doing nothing. I mean, cutting into the toe of the mountain, as Randy just said, is a huge deal. It's very expensive. And then it, it uh, <clears throat> cuts into the cutting into the toe of any of these mountains is a problem. I mean, that's why we don't have, you know, uh, that, that joining between um, uh, the back of Tulare and Thomas is because in 1937, when they cut the entire Bay Shore, that entire area slid from Thomas Avenue down to Bay Shore. So it's, it's huge. And this whole area back there is 
fastest moving landslide in Northern California. So we have to be very careful of that, but we can do things that are not sexy, but might just make things safer on Bayshore. I mean, that, that can happen without the millions of dollars to, to, to fix things. I mean, rocks and barriers, that would be my thought. Randy might think I'm nuts, but it's a thought. So I would put it in the top of that mix as well. I would not think you're nuts, ma'am, if I'm you, Madam Mayor. I think, I mean, really what you're talking about doing is kind of creating something that's a, a combined use class four cycle track. So instead of just relying on the rumble strips, uh, which are almost too late, because once by the time you hit the rumble strip, you're already coming off the road, we mm -hmm. could do uh, something similar to where we put up those 30 inch tall uh, white delineators along a spacing so that so that there would be a visual cue before you cross over those. And, and perhaps that would make pedestrian users of it feel safer. It wouldn't take away any of the way for like it's just one more idea for us to consider. We're happy to take all that on board. Yeah, and you know, we, you know, when you walk that area, it's not like you need to cut the toe to make an area more walk, walk, walkable. A lot of that stuff is just debris that's fallen down, and it could be, you know, go in there with a little um, backhoe and clear a bit out and throw rocks on the ground and call it a day for now, just to make something safer for people who are walking there. I mean, we didn't have. 65 mile an hour traffic coming up and down Bayshore 10 years ago. When I moved into town in 19, uh, 1994, we didn't even have a traffic light at that intersection. And now you can be going down Bayshore at 45 or 50 miles an hour and someone passes you at 80 miles an hour. And that's a completely different ball game than we had even five years ago. So whatever we can do. Well, hey, Madam Mayor, if, I, if I could just ask a question, um, Randy, uh, does the city of Brisbane have jurisdiction over Bayshore? Absolutely. All right, so it's not a Caltran uh, street. It's 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 something that Brisbane Street. It was deeded over to us in fee after they finished US one hundred and one. It was Caltrans, but now it's ours. All right, and you know the comment that you made about you know closing down a lane, making the outside lane a bike lane, and then the bike lane the sidewalk i mean that's that's a pretty bold um statement and, and but you know you made it and really made me start to think about it it's like you know that would be pretty cool though you're right there'd be a lot of folks that that probably would be like what the hell are you talking about right you know and so um it seems like if if we were gonna contemplate that we'd really want you know a lot of serious outreach you know like like a survey or something because that that is pretty major so i yeah i mean uh how, how would you go about you know kind of pitching an idea like that to the community well you, you know normally sir these sorts of ideas develop as areas are zoned and as development happens so if you think about driving out to gold country right as you go out there oftentimes you're on state route what is it four where you're going, I'm thinking like going out towards Bear Valley or going the other way towards Twain Heart, where it's a two lane road. Uh, and sometimes it's two lane with a passing lane and it's a 50 mile an hour road. But as you yeah. get into a developed area where there's a community, all of a sudden you see 45, 35, 25 and, and they speed it down. So this, this is very similar to that in my mind. You're taking a road that's maybe a very high speed two lane road, sometimes with three lanes, and you just choke it down to two. The only thing that would be odd about it and that we would have a little bit of trouble forcing the speeds down with it is we don't have the adjoining land development that would dictate a speed, right? So for, so for instance, what they call the prima facie on the face of it, speed limit in a residential area is 25. That, that's, that's automatically, you know, the, the high end speed there. Typically when you have adjoining commercial developments where pedestrians are crossing, maximum speed is 35. Here, you've got a lot of undeveloped area. So, you know, even if we, if, if we just took out a lane, that wouldn't slow people down. They would just be driving in a slot like bats out of Hades. So that's why even if we did that, we would have to move traffic around. I, I use the word chicane because that's common for swerving roads back and forth and you're forcing people to move. I mean, there are ways to do it. None of them terribly inexpensive, but they can all be done. Um, but again, we would just have to consider what the impact is on everything. Maybe at the end of the day, it's a better thing that it forces, you know, it, it prevents Bayshore from being a through cut uh, whenever there's an, an accident on US 101. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe maybe that's not the best and highest use. But right now, Bayshore Boulevard, if you look at the way it's classified, 
and the highway network that MTC and the, and the state system keeps, it's a principal arterial. And that's what, that's what its primary purpose is. And unfortunately, when you have a road categorized like that, uh, that's the primary movement is the through movement. It's not turning movements in or out of it. So it becomes really difficult. It's treated really, really much like what most people would consider a highway, like US 101, like one of the interstates. That's the way it tends to operate. And it's, I think we're getting to the point where we've developed enough and we've got a big enough residential mass that as we're trying to interact with that, it, we're getting friction there, right? where those two things uh, intersect. Council Member right, thank you. Well, if we are considered a, a major thoroughfare through road, whatever you just called it, Randy, mm -hmm. then isn't it up to MTC and these other bodies who are governing the freeways and the roads to be part of the solution and not just land it on us. Otherwise, we can just direct the traffic out around the lagoon, which is not the right answer either. But, you know, we do have, if, if we have done a traffic study, and I know we have mm -hmm. done a traffic study of how much traffic goes down that road compared to how much traffic went down that road 5, 10, 15, and 20 years ago, we have turned into a freeway with no benefit. That benefit is uh, nothing for us, that it's all a, a liability, every single part of it. We've got the increased traffic. It's a convenience for the people coming off Geneva and all those other areas who are taking Bayshore to 101 just in South City as the most convenient route to get onto 101 going south. That's what this is all about. Or the people who are going to work in South City. Genentech, all those things. Are we getting any benefit from Genentech for 50,000 of their people driving down our road every day? No. Then, you know, maybe we need to look at changing that. If we're taking all the liability and we're looking at trying to, from our financial perspective, fix this problem, then we need to be looking outside of Brisbane for that problem to be resolved. I mean, it's CCAG, BPAC, uh, MTC, all those people, and then the businesses in South City. I mean, how many people are going to work on the east side of South City right now? That's 20-fold that it was 10 years ago. And we're bearing that brunt with no benefit. I thank you for that rant, madam, because I agree with everything you just said. Well, thank you. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm glad I didn't say it. I think, I think the only thing that I'll, well, you know, I'm going to say this and I'll be pilloried for it anyway. I, I don't think MDC cares about us. I, I don't think they care about spending money on that quarter. I think their, their perspective is much more global uh, throughout the region. Uh, they, have, they have much, to their minds, bigger concerns. And I think if you look at the way um, that Brisbane has been seen, and the policies that would be imposed upon us by MTC and ABAG and BCDC, uh, they are not very attuned to our needs and to our, our, to our specific circumstances. Then let's reduce the speed limit to 25. So if I may interject, let's put, yeah. Bayshore, let's put Bayshore on the work plan for number four. Let's keep one, two, and three and say that's the start. And if I may ask, please, let's complete one project before we go to the next one. And um, with that in mind, I have nothing more to say on complete streets. Does anyone else have a comment? I think we're, we've probably gone through this enough times. Okay, we thank we you received, very much. Um, Madam Mayor, we received a chat comment maybe we should enforce the 45 miles per hour speed limit on Bayshore that's from Michelle Salmon complete streets you can always call our Brisbane Police Department and have them weigh in with you as well on that project okay thank you very much for the presentation um, again I want to acknowledge complete streets also the staff from public works attached to them and also our public works department, because they always do the implementation of these things. Next on our agenda, we have a communications program update. Could we please have a staff report? Yes. Good evening, honorable mayor and city council members. It is my pleasure to be with you before tonight. I'm Caroline Chung, your communications manager. And I'll be providing a update to you on the work that's being done in communications and to hear your guidance on a couple items towards the end of the presentation. 
I also wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you to Matt Ordonia, who came aboard at the end of October as the communications and digital media coordinator. He, like myself, majored in communications and has been a great asset in producing a number of videos for us so far. The first one being the State of the City Address that was presented at, in November of last year. And so Matt, if you wanted to just give the council a wave and say anything right now, please go yes. Yeah, good evening, City Council. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, myself and Caroline to the meeting. And we have a lot of exciting updates that we wanted to share. We prepared like a PowerPoint and, and a video. Great. So I'm really fortunate to have Matt um, join me. And without further ado, I'll share a video right now. Share sound, optimize for video clip. And I just wanted to mention that during the duration of the video that we're going to stop live transcription as you'll see that there's captions already shown on the video itself. The mission statement of the city's communications department, which is housed within the city manager's office is to connect Brisbane residents to their local government and to one another through timely, accurate and authentic communication. I, Caroline Chung, the city's communications manager together with the communications and digital media coordinator, Matt Ordonia, do this through various means. We're assisting city departments tell their stories through video, which will be shared in an upcoming commissions and committees orientation in the spring, and have helped highlight various initiatives and programs, such as the high efficiency toilet rebate offered through the Public Works Department, and the balanced Brisbane video for the city's planning department. Did you know that everyone who opens a water billing account with the finance department is sent what we refer to as new resident packet? Each month, we send out a dozen or so of these, which contain a star-shaped magnet with the city's website and 24-7 dispatch number, a brief history of Brisbane, our bicycle and pedestrian map, which includes hiking trails and our adopted safe pedestrian routes to schools, a community resources page of important phone numbers, a get-to-know Brisbane guide, North County Fire Authority safety brochures and a letter from the city manager, Clay Holstein. We recently took over management of the city sign boards from Parks and Recreation, so have been updating those on a regular basis. Did you know that outside of the new Brisbane Library, in the sidewalk is a metal display board where flyers are added so that this area midway down our downtown drag can serve as another city noticing board of our special events, programs, and open jobs? Well, now you do. Sometimes in this library posting board, you'll see flyers that have been published in the city's monthly news publication, The Star. The Star is printed at the local commercial print manufacturing company, Fong Brothers Printing. It's sent to every address in Brisbane, including to our business community. Have an article or flyer you'd like to suggest? Contact us at creatingcommunity at brisbanestate.org by the 15th of the month. There are times when we will issue press releases such as when an emergency situation has occurred in town or if there's an event we're hosting where we hope to get widespread regional turnout, such as the Stand with Asians vigil that took place in the community park in March of 2021 and drew over 500 people. For all other newsworthy items, we place them into the Weekly Blast, which is an electronic newsletter distributed to nearly 1,300 subscribers. If you'd like to add yourself to this weekly dose of information regarding city news, events, and meeting videos, not to mention a quote of the week, Get yourself signed up at brisbaneca.org slash subscribe. It's worth mentioning that the Blast, Star, and Meeting videos and everything else is housed on the city's website, brisbaneca.org. Our new website launched in April 2020, with the previous site accessible still at archive.brisbaneca.org, where you can find City Council and Planning Commission meeting agendas and minutes that date back to 2005, and City Council meeting videos that date back to 2009. Going back to the city's current website, we'll pin up the four top news items right on the homepage so that they're easily accessible to the community. We recommend using that big search bar anytime you want to be taken directly to something specific you're looking for. Are you on social media? So are we. We'd love to connect with you there and are posting almost daily, if not more, to the city's Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube accounts, not to mention next door. Follow or subscribe so that you don't miss a beat. We also love being social because, hey, it's social media after all, and enjoy answering your questions as they come. If you're not on social media, you can still see what's being posted via the bulletin on Channel 27. 
With the upgrade of our hybrid meeting equipment in the broadcast booth last year, the Channel 27 Bulletin, thanks to our partners at MCTV, now features our live Twitter feed, campaigns that we've run on social media, such as open seats for new commissioners and committee members, and an upcoming program schedule. We love sharing videos that we've created, but also those that have been produced and shared with us by partner organizations, such as North County Fire Authority and San Mateo County Libraries. Finally, the My Brisbane app, formerly GoRequest, was recently upgraded and now bears the city's logo. Download it if you haven't already in the app or Google Play Store. A web-based version is also available via the city's website at brisbanecaorg contact. In the app, you'll have direct links to key pages on our website, as well as direct links to some of our social media pages. We hope this provides you with a good understanding of the work that we do. Again, if any time you'd like to contact us, please reach out to creatingcommunity at brisbanecaorg or call 415-508-2157. Right. So, sorry, my screen share was blocking some of the top portion of the video, but that basically is an overview of everything that goes on. And you might have seen the city's logo sprinkled throughout um, that, and it's um, not unintentional. Um, we're going to transition now to the bulk of what was covered in the staff report. So I'm going to share my screen one more time to um, so that we can view some full picture um, slides. Right. Okay, so in the staff report, it talks about the genesis, if you will, of the city's revised logo that you may have noticed sprinkled throughout the video. And that's because it's included on in everything practically that we do, not just in the city manager's, manager's office, but all departments whether it's approving a permit or noticing a public hearing, sending a signed letter by the mayor on behalf of the council, it really is pervasive. And when it was noticed back in 2020 that variations of it were creeping up um, amongst different departments, the city manager assigned the task of getting a standardized logo to an internal staff committee, which is called the Brisbane Social Media User Group. And we were tasked to get a standardized logo that we could all use. Um, so it's made up of um, staff from all different departments on this internal working committee. And after a couple months and several meetings, we came to this logo that you see that's on the sign along Old County Road, uh, the community park sign. It retains all the significant elements of the original logo, the mountain, the stars, the bay, um, but it has the city's year of incorporation in the water and City of Stars on the bottom half is in capitalized letters. So it matches Brisbane in the top portion. There was a desire within the staff working group to have the specific department as part of the logo, especially the more public facing departments such as public works, planning and the marina. And this has been something Parks and Recreation has done for decades on their staff shirts and sweatshirts, jackets, et cetera. Mm -hmm where they have, um, if you can see, um, swapped out City of Stars for Youth Advisory Committee and Parks and Recreation in the lower half. So it was becoming clear that this was something that other departments could also do so that we could retain consistency across departments. Sarah Nahas in the Parks and Recreation Department helped to create department-specific logos where City of Stars was swapped for the various department names. You may have seen these implemented in various means, such as the Marina's monthly newsletter that the Harbor Master Andrew Rayburg sends out and departmental flyers and posts advertising various programs and projects. Sarah in the Parks and Recreation Department also helped create new decals for our front and side lobby doors at City Hall, which we applied last year. It was nice to be able to quickly prepare these and get them installed in-house. And as I mentioned, Public Works has their department specific logo that's um, been created and those will be applied to the new trucks in the fleet as they are replaced over time. So going on to our business cards and letterhead, when I came to the city 15 years ago, that was, um, this is the look of the business cards pretty much that I remember the blue linen um, letterhead also with matching blue envelopes and blue linen business cards. 
Over the years, we've made adjustments to the business cards. You see the revised logo with the year of incorporation in the corner. And we use Fong Brothers Printing to print our business cards and they know to swap out any previously used logos with this one when there are reorders for um, business cards. And looking at our letterhead, which bears, I believe, to be the original logo of the city, the square-shaped one. Um, the envelopes, though, have a round logo because we order those more often. And as far as I know, this blue linen letterhead has never needed to be reordered. And so there are some staff that continue to use it. However, many others have transitioned to electronic letterhead. It's not only easier to print, but makes better copies too. White versus the blue comes out looking uh, much better. This is what the electronic letterhead template looks like with a couple recent updates in the footer section. We print on 50% um, recycled paper. So we thought we should include mention of that. Just like how we say on the back cover of the star that it's printed on 100% recycled paper. And the tagline in the opposite corner was um, recently revised when, with the city's innovation committee. It's another internal staff working committee comprised again of various departments within the city. Um, we put forth to the rest of the staff this mission statement and it ended up having the most votes. So providing for today, preparing for tomorrow. It transcends um, what is decided at the council or policy level we felt as well that community members get the assistance that they need and work is being done at all levels to ensure the city is well equipped to meet the needs of tomorrow. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. We're looking to the council for guidance on the use of some of the older items that do not currently bear the revised city's logo, such as the pre-printed letterhead. And I'm looking forward to what the council suggests and I'm confident that any changes can be um, implemented swiftly citywide. So with that, I'll stop sharing my screen unless anyone wanted to see anything again. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Matt. I'm going to jump in first because looking at the changes you've made where you've, you've kept the integrity of the logo, but you've refined it, you've added the date, those subtleties are so important and, and I'm so thrilled with what you've done. You show me that blue letterhead and business cards and I go, we are way more dynamic than that. It's time for a change. Even just looking at the white letterhead that people are printing out on their printers at City Hall is just way better. I think that looking at what's transpired in the past five, 10 years, Carolyn, since you've been here, the the image that we portray has changed so dramatically and I am so extremely appreciative. Your efforts show everywhere in Brisbane. But I also would like to see us spend some time thinking about branding and how we portray ourselves because I see we're going into a new era with Brisbane and we are a dynamic city. And I don't think that we are presenting that image adequately yet. I'm not criticizing the past. I'm just saying, I think we have an opportunity to do that. And I'd like to see some changes. So that's my take on it. Let's hear from another council member. Council member Davis. Yeah, I just, was the ask like, because you have so much of the old letterhead still in existence and it's never been reordered is the ask whether you should just keep using that until it runs out and then reorder new letterhead with the correct logo or just swap it out now. Is that what the, is that what you're seeking guidance on? Yeah. How, I mean, personally, I hate to see us like waste paper. I just feel like we waste so much paper all the time. Like even just, you know, with printing our council agendas, right? There's so much paper wasting that we do as a city that would hate to like toss out perfectly good paper right now. And, and I would just, my recommendation would be to just move through that because it's already been printed. And I don't know that it's something that's totally noticeable to everyone who might receive something on that letterhead. Um, but 
I mean, my, my suggestion would be to just use it so we don't waste it. And then when it runs out, reorder more in the right, with the right logo. Council member Cunningham. Use the paper. You guys know I hate wasting paper. Okay. Council member O'Connell. I agree to use the paper. Council member Lentz. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I need to, <laughs> to you know, <laughs> mention that. I mean, yeah, that absolutely use the paper. But, you know, I, I want to echo what, what you said, Madam Mayor. I mean, Caroline, you're a rock star out there. I mean, you really put us on the map. It, it, it is, you know, a, a bigger city than, than what we actually are. And um, it's, yeah, it's, the, the logos are cool. And I, you know, I'm glad, Matt, that you're, you know, going to be um, partnering with Caroline to, to, to bring a, a, you know, a, a young, fresh, you know, spirit to the mix. Um, and yeah, just, just great work. I mean, we, you're, you're making us look good. And uh but Caroline, you, you, you just always done such an awesome, awesome job. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, we're, we're really fortunate to have you. So thank you for the dedication and the pride, the pride that you have in, in promoting what, what we all do. So I'm going to jump back in. You know, I, I see many city logos and they all have nice attributes. But then if I asked you, okay, you sat in a meeting and you stared at this logo. Could you tell me what was on it? And people can't. One thing that I've seen some other cities do in order to promote themselves is that they, they just come up with, with, I don't know what to call it, branding materials that just, just um, echo and state what the community is about, what they aspire to, what's important to them. And that, that level of sophistication, that concerted effort to state what your objectives are, I'm not sure that this logo and City of Stars says it, and I'm not knocking the logo. I'm not suggesting leaving it. I'm not suggesting not using up the letterhead. All, all I'm suggesting is I would really like us to think about other materials or graphics that we could do to promote Brisbane for who we are. And then someone's gonna say to me, oh, why are you trying to promote Brisbane? I think it, there's been years of perceptions of Brisbane just being this little community and you're so far behind everything. And that's not who we are. And, and we are rapidly building out Sierra Point. We have the Baylands, we have some name companies in Crocker Industrial Park, and we still in some ways look like little Brisbane. I'd like to upgrade our image a little, just how we present ourselves. So I don't know what that means, but I, I think our communications uh, department is very talented. And if we don't utilize them, we're crazy. So that's my comment. Is this okay. is what you're referring to like, it's good to be alive in coma? Yeah. But you know, we're looking at Brand Terry right now. I mean, Terry looks like she's on vacation. <laughs> in a really cool place he does <laughs> right and that logo when you look at that logo it makes you think hey you know i want to check that out uh, what's what's that place you know brisbane it, it looks it looks pretty cool i think i want to visit it and yeah so i'm i'm not even sure i have the right logo on my picture <laughs> you do <laughs> <laughs> i'm not seeing mine here so here i can there we go. Uh, uh, but I think it, does it say City of Stars or does it? It does. Okay. I think the first one I picked was Park and Recreation because I like the picture. Anybody else? Do we have any members of the public that would like to speak on this? I don't see any hands. Okay. I haven't Mayor. received any emails or text messages either, Madam Mayor. Okay. Ma Madam go. Mayor. Yes. Can, can I just, uh, 
um, since you brought this up and if it's of interest to the council, um, if, if we do want to, you know, take a fresh look at um, how we present ourselves and brand ourselves. And, you know, we, I think did this a few times over the years, but um, you know, I think it might be something where the council wants that form a subcommittee to work with staff and, I could see uh, not only the communication staff, but the economic development staff because, uh, uh, you know, uh, Madison just mentioned what Colma does and, and that's really more of their chamber of commerce and uh, how they present their business community. Um, so there's, you know, different approaches to this. Um, so if that's of interest to the, the council uh, or you know, something for you to think about, if, if it is of interest to you, we can put it on a future agenda for you to, uh, to do that. Sounds good, thank you. Okay, moving along, we have the staff reports. City manager, can you give us a report on upcoming activities? This will be quick tonight. So the first item is Balance Brisbane. Give your feedback by Sunday, February 6th on brisbaneca.org. This is the um, document or this is the simulation tool that we're using for updating our um, housing element. Um, we will be having um, meetings before the planning commission on February 10th and uh, 24th. Um, later tonight, you're going to set your um, calendar and um, we're going to be doing a uh, little bit about uh, the arena process on March 2nd in a workshop as well as having our affordable housing um, consultants come that night also. Um, recycle your soft film plastic bags at the post office, um, bin at po.boxes. Um, this is uh, the bread uh, or breed uh, top, zip top and uh, dry cleaning bags. Um, water bills are due on Monday, February 7th. Um, postmark payment or pay online at brisbaneca.org. San Mateo Credit Union on-site events at City Hall, February 11th. Um, this has been uh, from 1 to 5 p.m. This has been a fairly successful event. They've had quite a few people come through, and I know our previous mayor, uh, Cunningham, was uh, instrumental in uh, getting this idea on the table, and I think it's been very helpful to members of the community. Can I make a correction to that? Sure. The slide says February 8th, not the 11th. Uh, my apologies. I thought I had said the 8th. Thank you. And then finally, uh, the Lions Annual Crustacean Dinner Dance Party to go on Saturday, February 26th. Uh, you can order at brisbanelions.org. Um, note that the dance party is a virtual event on Zoom. Uh, you see their website and how to join and um, participate in the event. And that's it for tonight. Thank you. We move on to our Countywide Assignment Subcommittee reports. Who would like to go first? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> we had a Peninsula Clean Energy meeting on January 27th. Um, big topic of discussion was a program in the past year called e-bikes for everyone. And what it was, was a rebate program. It had an income requirement, low income, especially targeted, and the response was absolutely overwhelming. They ran out, I mean, within the first month. And it, it, they're still getting applications, even they've run out of money months ago. So there was another um, approval of $300,000 by the board to fund another whole round. Um, these will be targeted to, again, low-income communities, but it's going to be extend, extended to all income levels within the county, ultimately. Um, they, they're starting to talk about this as, as just a way to get people out of their cars, because some of the people that got bikes didn't have cars. Others had cars, and they said that after they got the bike, they didn't want to ride, their, ride in their car anymore. They enjoyed the bike so much. So this is going to be really interesting how it pans out and it's being seen as a, a, a good way to reduce automobile use significantly. So that, that was the big topic. 
Council Member Cunningham, did you have any committees? What, you're on mute? I, I only had four, so I'll share a couple of them, okay? Um, <clears throat> I had the Foundation for the San Mateo County Library, which is the fundraising arm of the JPA, um, just, just a, for an interest for everybody. The, um, the, new, the new people coming in to donate to the Foundation for Summer Programs for all of our community is just phenomenal. So that's that's that. Um, <clears throat> we had an OSEC uh, subcommittee meeting and that was discussed this evening, so we can leave that there. Um, the I think the most exciting one for me was our economic development uh, meeting with a presentation from the the company that is proposing hopefully to come into Brisbane and do carbon sequestration. And the biggest takeaway for me was very educational. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was a very educational meeting was that um, this, these new companies doing carbon sequestration, the rocks that they're using, and it sounds like sci-fi when you haven't been in front of this presentation, these rocks can take carbon out of the atmosphere four to 5,000 times more per square meter than a tree. And they can do it in two and a half days. This, this technology is being super funded around the country. And the company that's hoping to come into Brisbane is one of the top three companies in the country doing this. Um, so fingers crossed that something wonderful will happen with that. Colleen, did you want to add anything to that? Oh, it, 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 it was an interesting presentation because <clears throat> there are a lot of these companies starting up. I think there's about 300 just in the United States and they're getting venture capitalists. So where we saw Silicon Valley tech and then we saw biotech interest now with climate change, this is just almost moved to the top of the heap in terms of funding just by leaps and bounds because the mandates that we have to meet to curb carbon emissions are becoming so serious. So we're talking major investors with Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. And the fact that one of these companies is looking at Brisbane to start up here and potentially expand in Brisbane was just, it was really exciting. They, they just, they said they looked at different places and when they saw Brisbane, they went, wow, this is really where we want to be. And, and I would add to that just that um, with the build out at Sierra Point, I did some research and looked at also biotech and there's a lot of trade journals and they're all talking about Oyster Point was was the big place to be, and now everyone's talking about Brisbane. So this is it's really an interesting development. But the presentation it was it was very exciting, and the technology itself it's just stunning what they can do. But we're going to need a lot of it. So yeah. So so just you know for the public who might be listening, just look up carbon sequestration technology. It's really really fascinating. Who knew limestone would be so cool? Um, uh, we had a public art meeting. Madison, do you want to talk about that? Uh, we had a public art meeting. We discussed like some locations for public art um, and different areas in town that weren't necessarily on our list, but who those if art were to go there, who would it be serving and what would be the purpose? Eventually we settled on moving forward with looking at the space behind the bathrooms at the um, community park as an area we could do some public art. Um, we also thought it would be a great place to do like art out of living materials um, they do a lot of that in San Francisco, like in the Presidio and stuff. They do structures and different things out of um, natural materials, and then they're meant to last only for a certain period of time. So um, that kind of led to a discussion about that being an area where art could have, could come and go. Um, and it's just kind of a place that there's not like a lot going on behind there. So we kind of wanted to give it, it like a sense of place. Um and, you know, recognize that the three kind of main 
parties or the main demographics that would be interacting with that area would be, you know, people who were at the park, maybe people with small children and, you know, their, their child fell asleep in the stroller and they needed kind of a quiet place to be. That's more of like a quiet area of the park. Um, there's also some picnic tables there. So we see occasionally some parties being hosted there on the weekends. Um, and then also that does, that area is seen by passerbys, pass, you know, vehicles driving by. So that would be an area that people in cars, uh, could see art, you know, driving by there. So the thought is to hire a consultant who specializes you know, in, we would put out that that would be the area and hire like a consultant to help us curate for that area specifically, um, who would know what the best sort of type of art would be to go there. There's thoughts about a Zen garden. There's thoughts about something with water elements, but we were really careful to not allow our personal con conceptions of what could go there influence, you know, what the, what the plan for the spaces, but to really give it to a consultant who specializes in helping us curate and like kind of let them run with it um, and just kind of see what artists come through and what they propose. So that was uh, where we left that conversation. I have another committee. Do you, do you want me to go now or Karen, did you have- I have one more which I'm going to hand to Cliff because I really have lost my voice. The transportation demand management. Cliff, do you want to fill that one in? Okay, then Cliff. Right, well, you want to go, Madison? Yeah. Well, do you want to, I'll do idea committee really fast because that was also with Cliff. And basically what we talked about was already mentioned in this meeting earlier and already voted on. So that's it for me. All right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Karen and I um, met the, yeah, the, the TDM ad hoc committee and um, we discussed moving forward with uh, FERS and peers um, to work on creating a citywide uh, TDM plan. So um, I guess probably in some months, uh, they'll put something together and then we'll eventually, uh, you know, bring it to the full council and, and, and evaluate, um, you know, how to implement that. I think standardization was a, a big word that we used in this meeting. So keep your fingers crossed that we bring something good to full council. That's it, thank you. Okay, Terry. Hello. Um, so I attended the um, SFO roundtable meeting last night and the technical working group that I sit on that committee brought back a recommendation to the entire roundtable to initiate the a new night hush procedure that the stakeholders, the airport, TRACON, and the FAA have all bought into. Um, it is basically um, taking the planes and having them go up the bay on uh, takeoff from and out to the Golden Gate Bridge and to a waypoint and a height that when they circle back around to go south or to the east, they're going to be at a much higher elevation. Um, we could not take a vote on it last night, but we're having a special meeting in the next week, I think, um, to vote on that, to accept the limitations that the airport put that they really thought it was only going to be sustainable from 1 till 5 a.m. We we're hoping to get it extended to longer hours and we're going to keep working to get those hours extended. But I think it is something that the FAA and the airport said they can implement within the next 90 days. So we should be seeing some relief on those flights um, in the wee hours of the morning, starting in about 90 days, which is really good news to finally have something that sounds like an accomplishment. We'll see in actuality on how much it is utilized and used, 
But the good point is that this is not just for SFO flights. It is also going to be merging the stream with the Oakland flights. So they will also be on this path going out the Golden Gate Bridge. So oh, that is fantastic news, <laughs> Terry. Really, that really is was oh, man. fantastic news. Um, yeah. You know, they what? guaranteed those hours that they think they can do that even once they get back to pre-pandemic levels. They couldn't guarantee us the bigger hours um, of flight diversion um, once they get back to pre-pandemic. So we're hope hopeful that the board will um, vote to accept those those hours and keep working to get them extended and see how it works. But merging those two streams of flights, because a lot of the flights that wake us up are coming from Oakland in the middle of the night. So Terry, we have good news on that. Terry, when you said they couldn't guarantee the hours pre-pandemic, do you mean that this would be the hours for now, but they might change it? Or do you no, mean- They're saying we had asked for um, 12 o'clock till, um, till 5 a.m. or 12 to 6 a.m. Um, for the flight diversion. And they said that would not be sustainable, they don't think, merging Oakland and SFO once they get back to post pan, you know, to oh. pre pandemic levels. So they were willing to guarantee that even when they get back to regular flights, they'll be able to keep this initiative in place. So um, we're hopeful that the majority of the SFO roundtable votes for this and the FAA can do their six, their 90 day in, um, implementation and training. So <clears throat> that was good news. And I was um, asked to go ahead and be on the technical working group again this coming year, which I accepted. And then I attended a local policymakers group, which deals with high-speed rail and um, Caltrain's electrification. <clears throat> and we did not have any report from high-speed rail. We did hear from the electrification and their construction of the project and delivery of cars is coming along. Evidently, they've also had a large cost overrun that the, the board approved to go ahead and, and guarantee those funds. And so it's moving along with more construction. And so it was just a status update. Really good news, really good news. I, a lot of people will sleep better once those planes stop knocking them out of bed. Okay. We hope so, we hope so. So, and I do wanna thank um, Peter Grace, especially um, for his help with me on that, with the citizens group that uh, we haven't had a formal meeting in the last couple months, but we've had a couple informal meetings and he is always a help to me in understanding some of the technical jargon. Thank you. And indeed, Peter Grace, thank you from all of us. Um, City Clerk, do we have any written communications received? Madam Mayor, I'd like to also f flash on the screen our um, City Council schedule. The next one being um, on February 10th for our interviews. Would it be okay to start that meeting at six o'clock? We have about 24 applications and 22 people to interview. So it, it's an ambitious schedule. We did really well tonight. I think we can do it. It's probably gonna take four hours, which takes us up to 10 p.m. Any comments? Anyone want to weigh in on this? Want to start earlier? Is six the time? That just feels like so many interviews for one day. 
Well, if we, if we keep, if we're all prepared, we have our questions ready and we keep it on schedule, looking at the way we got through tonight, I think we can do it. If you wanna schedule another separate meeting, we could do that, but then we need to talk about when. <clears throat> um, for right now, that's um, park and rec applications. There are eight idea applications. There are seven. And for OSEC, there are nine. I mean, I, I, I would think it might make sense if we're really going to try to do it all in one go that maybe earlier. But I mean, I feel like every time we've ever done interviews, except for today, when there's so many they start like, you go a little bit over two minutes here, two minutes there, three minutes here, and they all start, they just all start backing up. And that's- Maybe if we, maybe if we started at five and planned for a 30 minute break in the middle that we stuck to so that we can stretch our legs and, um, and, and clear our brains, it would be more successful. I think that's a great idea with the break because the, the, we had a little break before this meeting and that really makes a difference. Yeah. So it does, everyone, does everyone think they could do five? Council member Lentz? Well, he Isn't can't that, be there. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to see if there's a possibility that I can attend, but at this time, um, it's probably unlikely, but, you know, we'll see. But it's starting at five would not make a difference whether you can attend compared to six. It, it, no, it, it wouldn't. Okay. Okay. Council member Cunningham, can you make five? I can. I'll be calling in from out of state, but I should be fine. Okay. So then let's, let's schedule 5 p.m. Karen, are you going to be on the same time zone? Yes. Okay, good. 30 minute break in the middle. Ingrid's just somehow find a break for us in there of 30 minutes. Sure thing. Okay. Um, Madam Mayor, just to, uh, as I said earlier, that, um, and it doesn't make that much difference in terms of your calendar, but just to be clear that March 3rd is actually going to be primarily a workshop. Um, and then we'll have a very, very small regular business agenda that evening. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, oral communications, city clerk, any member of the public wanting to make a public comment? Madam Mayor, I did want to um, uh, emphasize that we did receive written correspondence oh. from Dennis Bussey and William Locke on um, February 2nd. All right, thank you. Um, very and in much. terms of oral communications, I did not receive any emails or text messages, and I do not see any raised hands at this time. Okay. City Clerk, can you scroll um, up a little bit, down a little bit, I guess? I just was double checking the dates, so. I'm sorry, spot. for um, the meetings? For the meetings, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, a little bit further down. Okay, thank you. I will not be available for the July 21st meeting. I thought our last meeting in July was the 7th. I'll be leaving the country on the 8th. We'll try to update the, um, this calendar um, soon. Uh, as you know, we usually take a summer break. So um, I'll work with the mayor and you know we, we might be able to the Ju July 7th probably doesn't work because it's so close to the 4th. Um, so we might maybe even think about moving it to the 14th and then uh, having that be the final meeting before the, the summer break. But we'll, we'll uh, <coughs> get back to you next week or next, uh, well, two weeks from now. Okay. okay. Terry, did you see what you need to see? Yes, and I appreciate the caveat that the uh, city manager gave about uh, dates needing to still be firmed up. Okay. That being said, we are up for adjournment at 1031 p.m. Thank you do we, very much. Do we need to have, um, do we have public 
oral communications to? Um, we didn't have anyone there. Yeah, there, there are no hands raised and there were any emails or text messages. Okay, great. Okay. 